The San Diego Jane Doe, also known as Bag Lady Doe, identified as Elaine Rose Armstrong. This one begins 42 years ago in San Diego, California, on October 16, 1981. A woman described as a local transient was found behind Vic's office supply at 1753 Garnet Avenue in San Diego, California. The woman was well known to people in the neighborhood. Because of this, they would give her the nickname Bag Lady Doe, which I have to admit, I do not like. I feel like I have to say it because it's on here, but it seems pretty insulting to me. And that said, while this sounds insulting, she was so much more than that to them too. She was considered a neighborhood fixture. But while they knew her by sight, they didn't know her name. She had brown hair, dentures, a print head scarf, a wool jacket, a blue shirt, and a windbreaker. Her COD was brutal. I'm trying to think of a way to say it without tanking the video. And of course, with my little foray into demonetization, also don't want to mess anything up. You can see on screen now in an article that I'm showing, and she was unclothed from the waist down. If you're just listening and you can't see what's on the screen, I will say that she was pierced with something and suffered blunt force. I hate dancing around this so bad. I feel like she deserves more respect than that. The whole thing is evil. I can't imagine an elderly woman trying to make it living outside, and then this was done too. Ending up wiping a name for nearly four decades. Her purse was found nearby, and the person who did this burnt the purse on purpose. There was an ID inside, but it was burnt to the point that it couldn't be read. Othram Labs, at the direction of the San Diego District Attorney, performed their usual magic, and they discovered our Jane Doe was a 51-year-old woman from Kalamazoo, Michigan, and she was named Elaine Rose Armstrong. She had been born in 1930. I wish I knew more of who she was or how she ended up living where she did. I do know that they have begun the process of trying to get DNA from clothing that was found with her in order to help identify the perpetrator. So they are trying to find out who did this. The unfortunate reality, of course, is that after four decades, the likelihood the person who did this to her is even still alive is maybe not great. Even if they beat the odds to find him, that person would have been able to live their life for decades and decades without paying. It's just incredibly unfair. I almost said maybe they could find the reason, but what reason could there be? There's no valid reason. But it is important that anybody with any information about this case call the sheriff at the number located on the screen or Crime Stoppers at 888-580-8477. Elaine Rose Armstrong was unidentified for 42 years. She was found 2,218 miles or 3,570 kilometers from where she was last known to live. Had she lived, she would be 93 years old today. Sahara Sioux, identified as Gwen's story. This is one of those identifications that so many of us have really been waiting for to happen. Some of the cases just touch us in a spot that others don't. Maybe there's no rhyme or reason why, but she is one of the more well-known cases, and she was actually one of the first episodes I ever did on this channel. The story begins on August 14, 1979, and this was when the remains of a woman found in a field near the intersection of Las Vegas Boulevard South and Sahara Avenue in Las Vegas, Nevada. Because of her name, I always believed she'd been found by the Sahara Casino, to be honest, and I assume others probably feel the same, but she was actually found on Sahara Avenue, north of the Las Vegas Strip. This was in an open field by the Silverbird Hotel and Casino, which was sold and reopened three years after she was found. It would eventually reopen as the El Rancho Casino. For anyone who hasn't been to Las Vegas, that area of Vegas in and around the Strip probably paints a picture of tons of people walking close together, even though the casinos are pretty far apart. Often there's stores along the walkways even and people milling in and out of those. But while that's true for some of the Strip, it's not true for all of the Strip. And I would say especially not on the north end of the Las Vegas Strip where she was found. This end, as far as my own experience, it's pretty vacant as far as foot traffic. We stayed at the Riviera three times, actually, going for my husband's teaching conference. While he was in class, I'd walk around and like to people watch. And there was only so much you could do in this area, especially as it moved farther out, as she was found farther north. 
Vegas changes really quickly, the star dressed in Riviera, for instance, they're gone. And while it looks different, the location is still pretty sparse by comparison. Also, at least in my experience, people approach tourists for money in that area of the Strip. It's the only time I've been asked, I think. Not that people aren't panhandling in other places, but I'm talking coming up and bothering you. That's the only area of town I ever felt a little bit afraid. So she was found in the field around 9 p.m. by someone who was walking nearby. It's believed it's most likely that she passed three to four hours earlier, which if accurate means it was daylight when someone stabbed her with a knife. She had unfortunately been doing some serious drinking that day, and she had a blood alcohol level of 0.238, which is extremely high. When investigating this case, I saw an analysis that would suggest that this would equal 10 alcoholic drinks in a two and a half hour time period. She was also very thin for her height. She was 5'6", or 168 centimeters, and only 100 pounds, or 45 kilograms. And she was probably no match for whoever did this to her due to her inebriated state, and there weren't any signs that she fought back. There were also no signs of SA, although she is described as being partially unclothed when found, so possibly someone took a souvenir or the perpetrator was interrupted. She did have on Levi's and a bluish-green button-up linen shirt that had a tie-up bottom and red floral embroidery with sequins. It's an image many of us have seen many times on the Jane Doe posters. She had wavy hair and her toenails were painted red. One of the most surprising details is that she had no teeth, which even given the time this was when she passed, in 1979, even that wasn't common. It was unusual for her age. And she was found with dentures on the top, but there were none on the bottom. She had jewelry that she was still wearing, two gold necklaces, one with a turquoise stone and another with a clear plastic heart. They believed her clothing that remained had been purchased in Florida, leaving them to believe she probably wasn't from Las Vegas. But Vegas also is so different from any other area in the U.S. In 1979, nearly 12 million people visited Las Vegas from all over the world, and that number today is 42 million. She was wearing no shoes, but they may not have been taken. Her feet indicated she'd been walking around Las Vegas barefoot quite a bit. I can't imagine this was on purpose. She was found in August, and I've actually been in Vegas in August myself, and it was 119 degrees, which would be 48 Celsius. Now, obviously, it's not always like this, but Vegas is a desert, and it gets super hot. So it makes me wonder if she had shoes. I don't know. No one really knows what her situation was at the time. It's possible she was in that field because she couldn't be walking around until the sun started to set. Even on the less brutally hot days there, it's usually in the high 90s or around 37 degrees Celsius. Her case is one of those that's tugged at the community heart, as well as many of us here at home. Multiple recreations were done and released in hopes they would find her name. Vegas is a different beast, though. A lot of people run away and end up there. And females are especially at risk as they're the main group that is taken advantage of. Her case would make the local news and someone would come forward to say that they saw her with another man at the liquor store just hours before her death. He was actively being sought as a suspect. They placed him as being in his late 20s at the age of 28 was given as a guess at the time. If that age was correct, the suspect would be born in 1951. That would make him 72 years old right now. At the time, he had brown hair and a brown mustache, and he was around 5 foot 11 and 165 pounds or 180 centimeters and 75 kilograms. I don't show post-mortem photos, but you can find them online if anyone is interested. In 2016, a lead would come forward saying they believe she lived in a trailer park in the area and was using the name of Shauna. They also said they believe she worked at a Holiday Inn or a motel on Las Vegas Boulevard. Now, we already know her name was Gwen and not Shauna. Let me know what you guys think. I'm not sure why the shoe thing bothers me so much, but given the time of year, it just makes me wonder if she was running around that way if she had shoes, which would make it less likely she was working somewhere, even under a fake name. But given the temperatures, I just can't help but wonder. They did do a pollen isotope test, and they're inaccurate sometimes but they believe she lived in Napa Valley or Central Valley, California before she was found. And as I mentioned, they believed her clothing came from Florida. Thanks to Genetic Genealogy and Othram Labs, 
We now know a little bit more, but there's still more to be learned. Gwen's story was from Cincinnati, Ohio, not California or Florida, as they speculated. And she was just 19. There's virtually nothing that came out as I record this. Because her case was so well known, I had hoped to offer more. But with maybe some more time, more will come out. We know that she left home without telling her family and that she was with two men in the summer of 1979. She had left on a quest to find her biological father. The names of her travel companions, however, have been lost over time. At most, she could have been in Vegas for a few months. She hadn't been missing very long. We don't know when those two men reappeared, but her family did see them again in Cincinnati, and Gwen was nowhere to be found. They would tell the family that she didn't want to leave, and they left her in Vegas. The police desperately need their names and to speak to them. Crime Stoppers allows anonymous reporting at 702-385-5555. Gwen's story went unidentified for 44 years. She was found 1,964 miles or 3,160 kilometers from home. Had she lived, she would be 63 years old today. Huge thanks for watching all the way to the end, and a big thanks to all of you who consistently like and comment on the videos. Whether you leave a full comment or an emoji, it makes a huge difference. So if you consistently watch my videos, maybe take a moment to subscribe. It's a huge push toward the videos being suggested to new people. The next goal is 20,000. Thanks everyone for watching. Take care of yourselves and each other.